Phil Longman, and uh, I'm a senior uh, fellow here and also uh, the research director of our uh, new social contract policy. I have to say uh, this has to be the most hardcore group of <laughs> that exists in Washington, a self-selected population of people who on the nicest weather day of 2008, most likely, have um, come here to ponder uh, the demographics of the 2020s. <laughs> um, but uh, we all know what we're about, and <laughs> we're here anyway. So um, I think this is going to be a, a great program. Uh, I, I personally have been uh, plowing the fields of, of demographics for, I guess, close to 30 years now. And I, and I have to say that it's, it's a rare day in that field when uh, you wake up and something new has happened in demography. <laughs> um, the basic outlines of the world we live in today, in terms of its population structure, was uh, completely predictable um, back in the 1970s. Um, and many people made those predictions quite accurately. Um, a few things along the way have been a little bit surprising. Um, the vantage point of the mid 1970s that looked like uh, Jerry doing it. Just don't bother me. Excuse me. In the 1970s, it looked like the United States might have caught the same disease that was going through Europe that was causing uh, fertility rates to fall below replacement levels. And I suppose there's probably a few folks who are somewhat mystified why, until this day, uh, the United States remains the one great exception in having uh, birth rates that are at or near uh, replacement levels, while throughout the rest of the developing world, uh, fertility has continued to decline. I suppose in the 1990s, another sort of surprise that came along gradually is, well, people had been of the mind that there must be some mechanism in the human uh, mind and body uh, that over time would lead to uh, an equilibrium rate in fertility such that um, uh, you know, replacement levels would be achieved. Um, and that would be only sorts of exogenous events would come in and maybe frustrate people from having the 2.1 children they were hardwired to have. Um, but now it looks like uh, we've seen fertility just fall and fall and fall in parts of Europe and Asia uh, for more than a generation. We've seen desired family uh, size fall below uh, uh, replacement level. And so we've kind of had to set aside the notion that maybe there's something about the human animal, some instinct to breed or to replace ourselves. Um, clearly, uh, without the right social and economic conditions, uh, whatever genetic endowment we have in that direction just doesn't express itself. Um, and I guess another surprise that came along the way was the fact that uh, in modern societies, mortality could increase. So that we saw in the Soviet Union, for example, um, actual declines in life expectancy. These weren't things that were predictable. Um, so as I said, um, it's a rare day in de demography when something truly new happens. It's also a rare day when um, people in this field um, have truly brilliant insights um, into the meaning of these long-term certain trends. And that's why I'm so thrilled uh, to be able to introduce to you today uh, Neil Howe and, and Richard Jackson, who are by far um, the most insightful observers of global demographic trends, um, not only today, but going back 20 some years. Um, and not only that, but they have just recently had a new burst of creativity uh, in this new report that they're going to present to you, um, which uh, was jaw dropping to me in its, its insight. Um, I've known both these gentlemen for a very long time. Uh, Neil uh, describes himself as an an historian, and an economist, and a demographer, um, but he's really m more than all that. He is all that, but he's more than all that. He is someone who has not only accurately predicted the broad outlines 
of changing demographic realities uh, con correctly and consistently over the last 30 years, um, but has also been able to, to have the intuition um, to predict um, very subtle things about what the social mood would be of different decades and what would be the personality of emerging new generations. And so it's quite amazing to go back today and read a book he wrote or uh, published in the 1990, right, um, in which he predicted um, the personality, the um, sensibility um, of this emerging millennial <coughs> generation now in college when it was not yet in kindergarten um, and using a process that I'm not sure I quite understand but consistently yields up um, true predictions if you live long enough to see them. Um, uh, it's very impressive. Uh, Richard um, is also um, an amazingly gifted um, demographer and thinker. Uh, he is currently directing the Global Aging Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, and there over the last several years has done really a uh, bang up work, uh, both on a country by country basis uh, and on a global basis about um, the economic and, and strategic implications of this new demographic order um, that we're all aging into. And, you know, I could particularly commend to you the, the work he's done on, on China and Korea. Um, which was groundbreaking at the time and is still news to most folks. Um, so without any further ado, have you duked it out about who's going first? Uh, well, I, I, I'm just, let me, let me just say a word. Correct the record, I'm sorry. The, the word, well, <laughs> having, having so thoroughly oversold us, um, I, I hesitate to even begin. But, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, we, 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 we just released uh, uh, the advanced proofs of a, new study called The Graying of the Great Powers that um, looks at how demographic trends uh, are, are likely, in our view, to shape the geopolitical landscape um, uh, over the next uh, half century. Uh, um, that will be out in uh, a book form, um, uh, uh, cer certainly by the first week in uh, May, uh, if not uh, uh, sooner. Um, now, our our viewpoint is, is that of the United States and the developed countries uh, uh, in particular, um, but our uh, uh, canvas is global, uh, if, if, if you will. We look both um, at how population aging and population decline in the developed world is likely to affect or may affect both the ability and the willingness uh, of today's uh, uh, rich countries to maintain national and global security. Um, and we also look country by country and region by region at how demographic change is shaping new threats and opportunities in the developing world. Um, now, I'm going to turn it over to Neil, who will talk a little bit about the constraints that demography imposes uh, on the developed countries, and then he'll pass it back to me uh, to talk about um, um, our uh, uh, interpretation um, um, and analysis of uh, demographic trends in the developing world, um, which we uh, think uh, are pushing uh, uh, towards um, a possible crisis in the 2020s. Great. Thank you. And Phil, thanks for the opportunity. I should have started out by saying this. No problem. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start, and uh, I'm going to put myself on sort of a Prussian train schedule here. We're going to move really quickly. The whole idea is to get through our part uh, so that you can ask questions, and uh, mainly going quickly so that you can simply see the subject areas and the various topics that we cover, obviously in much greater depth uh, in the book. Uh, so let me start out by the way of background here. I always have trouble with these devices. Oh, there we go. OK, we're moving. Uh, assessing the projections. First of all, and much of this you already know, which is another reason I'm going to go quickly, the whole world is aging, and the developed countries are leading the way. Uh, and as you can see, uh, you see the share of the elder population. It's going up in both developed and, and less developed. But it's obviously go it's starting going up first in the developed world. And you can see. Even by the year 2050, the less developed world will not quite be as, as old as the developed world is today. 
So you can see these trends dramatic uh, as they are, again, uh, in the dispersion. Obviously, in the develop developing world, you have a great variety of areas, you know, from Sub-Saharan Africa at one end to East <coughs> Asia at the other, which are two ends of this uh, aging spectrum. Um, here you can see the diversity within the developed world. Uh, and this theme we'll come back to uh, a couple of times here. But as you can see, the U.S. is the least aging of the, of the developed countries. <coughs> you see it, just looking at the big six here, uh, Japan and Italy, particularly Southern Europe in general, and Japan are at the long, uh, at the high edge. Particularly the difference is that although the U.S. is going to age dramatically, uh, particularly during the 2020s and early 2030s with the aging of the baby boom, which is such a pronounced demographic feature of, 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 of the uh, American and English-speaking countries, it stabilizes after about 2035, whereas the rest of these countries continue to age, and that's why they're, by the year 2050, they're much older. Uh, the next thing is, is uh, the point to make, obviously, is the two f forces driving this aging is falling fertility and rising longevity. Uh, falling fertility, uh, Phil uh, already alluded to this, uh, but in the early 1960s, every developed country, and you can see certainly all of the big s uh, seven countries, had fertility rates well over the replacement rate. Today, every developed country has fertility rates under or at the replacement rate. The U.S. now is just budging up to just about 2.1, and France is also uh, slightly higher now, but they're all under, and as Phil was pointing out, many of these countries are way under. Again, life expectancy, this is the other driver. Not only are there fewer people being born, which reduces the population profile at the young end, but they're living longer, which expands the population pyramid at the uh, old end. Populations in most developed countries will not only age, but stagnate or decline, and that's due to this declining fertility. Particularly countries with lower than replacement rate fertility will necessarily uh, ultimately decline in size. And here you can see some of the trends. Here is the entire developing world, these two bars. This is the total population and the working age population change. You can see this is the U.S., okay, continuing to grow quite a bit more. This is the rest of the developed world, actually declining by uh, working age population declining by 17 percent over the next 50 years, and the overall population by 3 percent. You can see, of course, some of these uh, uh, countries with very uh, low fertility rates are going to be shrinking uh, quite rapidly. Particularly, they're going to be shrinking after the year 2020. Generation gap and growth gap between U.S. and the rest of the world, and that simply follows from this fact. And we're going to we're going to uh, come back again uh, to that repeatedly. Global aging, as what we often call, as close to social science comes to a certain prediction about the future. Remember, everyone age 60 in the year 2050 has already been born. We can already count them. Uh, this is no mystery here. And even uh, uh, looking 30 years down the road, although fertility rates may change. There's something called demographic momentum. Even if fertility rates rise, the fact that there's so few young adults means it's going to take a lot, many years of increased fertility rates in order to substantially increase the aggregate uh, uh, actual number of uh, babies being born. Consequences for the developed country in terms of its outlook, population and GDP of the developed world will steadily decline as a share of the world total. Population share will go down gradually, and you can see this as a share of the total, down to just over 10% by the year 2050. Uh, and the GDP share will be down more sharply, as you can see, particularly due to the suddenly much slower growth of the working age population in the developed world, <coughs> and also due to, at least in our projections, the fact that the last 10 years have been accelerating <coughs> economic growth in much of the developed world, particularly places like China and India. Population and GDP in the United States, uh, on the other hand, will steadily rise as a share of the developed world, right? So this is another, uh, this is another uh, uh, feature uh, that you're going to see. Uh, G this is the sh uh, U.S. share of the G total GDP of the, de of the developed world, which was at its lowest right around the 1970s and 1980s, is already recovering on a purchasing power parity basis. And as you can see, population continuing to increase as a share of the developed uh, world total. English-speaking population, 42% of the developed country total 
uh, in uh, 1950 will be 58 percent by the year 2050. Uh, U.S. GDP will exceed the 1950 share by 2025. So you can see that's another theme is this uh, re uh, renewed importance of the U.S. And obviously, too, a reordering of the largest nation roster. This is a list of the largest nations of the world population-wise in the year 1950. Six of the top 12 were developed countries, and one remaining one was, of course, Russia. First and second world were seven of the top 12. In 2005, only three of the top 12 are first or second world, U.S., Japan, and Russia. By the year 25, the U.S. will be the only remaining member of the first or second world uh, that will be on this list. Interestingly, remaining right at number three. And uh, India and China will trade places at number one and number two. Consequences? Well, <coughs> one is it's just the consequence and the change in absolute size. And we went back and looked historically and looked at military strategists and uh, national strategists and also looked at economists looking at why does this matter? Why does population size matter? Well, here are some of the sort of the lessons of history, as it were. Foregone advantages of population size, obviously one of them, and this is an age-old story, is military. Service age mobilization. You know, Klaus Fitz once said that higher numbers is the principal, uh, is the prime, is the the number one principle in determining victory, Voltaire used to say that uh, God favors the bigger battalions. This is an old rule in history, and it comes back to us in places like Iraq, right? People complain about boots on the ground. How many people do we actually have to serve? An old lesson in history. But non-military as well, migration and occupation. Take a look at, it, at countries like uh, Russia, which are now demographically imploding, and look at how you have Turks from the south, Koreans, Chinese from the east, and you see the actual native ethnic Russian population <coughs> beginning to migrate west and north. And you can see there's almost an osmosis effect. When a, when a population is declining, this historically might actually be more important than this, the non-military migration effect. Uh, and here you can see, just in terms of recruitment age population, of course these are the younger populations, it's even more dramatic the change than in working age or overall population. Foregone advantages of economic size. Obviously, a superior economy can, in terms of uh, in terms of national defense, national security, is logistics, training, and weaponry. Uh, in terms of non-military, international transfers, commercial and financial leverage, economies of scale, um, and uh, 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 Ken Denniston over at uh, Brookings Institute, and he worked on uh, his his uh, Denniston worked on his. I, uh, co is, is study looking at the causes of increased productivity in America since 1929 estimated that 18% of total increase in productivity was due to economies of scale. Simply the, so the effect of having a larger economy, almost the same effect as capital formation itself. And obviously a further constraint in aging, in, in rapidly aging countries, is the projected fiscal crowding out. And this is going to be huge. Here you see, compared to defense, the size of the increase in, um, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the size of total old age benefits. Uh, is that correct? Is the, no, it, it's, it, the chart compares the current level of defense spending as a share of GDP in each country with the projected growth uh, in old age benefit spending. So <coughs> compounded to the fact of uh, foregone size is the fact these rapidly aging countries will have enormous constraints in their public sector budgets. There, there'll be fiscal pressure, uh, not just on defense, but on any um, uh, uh, international spending, whether development assistance or anything else. Foregone advantages of both, a proven track record for failing in conflict. This is hard power, the fact that countries which are bigger and more uh, have a larger economies generally tend to prevail in, uh, in uh, serious wars and also in multilateral leadership, what Michael, uh, Michael Mandelbaum might call the case for Goliath, right? The fact that a large country is able to, to actually set up uh, some sort of world government or international rules in which uh, uh, order can, uh, uh, order can, uh, can prevail. Uh, another thing we covered is changes in economic performance. And I'm going to go through these quickly. Economic structure and these aging and, and uh, uh, stagnating population economies, we're going to see falling rates of investment, falling ratio of producers to consumers. Obviously, since 
much more of the population will be retired, and a shift of consumption from young to old that's already taking place, of course. Savings rate. Theory and data suggest a fall in the savings rate and probably a fall more than investment rate. This is the new wisdom that's just emerged over the past 10 years, which we examine in some detail in the book. The fact that all these, uh, these uh, uh, multi-nation regression models now suggest that we're going to see a considerable fall in the savings rate, uh, more than the investment falls. And of course, this will, uh, one of the reasons we're going to see savings fall, not just because of declining private sector savings, but huge pressure again from public sector to savings. And here you can see simply the impact on public sector deficits of the increase in public and public pension spending if, if just in public pension spending if that were all translated into deficits uh, global capital obviously if the savings declines more than uh, investment we're probably going to see a rising inflow to the developed world resulting in larger and more volatile trade imbalances rising debt service costs rising political influence wielded by creditors the the whole issue of uh, but the sovereign wealth funds right is now rising uh, already in the headlines today and the possibility or fear of default uh, other economic issues workforce aging take a look at this the ratio of workers over 50 to the ratio to the number of workers under 30 in the developed world 61% in 1980 look where it's going look where it's going to be in Germany and Japan well what do we know about an older workforce uh, again an issue we examine in the book more risk averse, less mobile. There's a lot of discussion in the literature about that. They're closer to retirement, they're more risk averse, they have ties to the community and families, they're less mobile. It tends to transform frictional unemployment into structural unemployment. They're less, they're less entrepreneurial. We have something called the Global Entrepreneurship Survey, which the London School of Economics publishes yearly, which makes this point emphatically, globally, that entrepreneurs tend to be young. With slight cost in overall productivity, but a large shift in the type of productivity. We have a discussion there if you're interested in pushing what's called fluid to crystallized abilities. It turns out old people do have productivity advantages, but they tend to be in doing very well the things that they've always done. And when the economy experiences a sudden shift and the rules of the game change, it turns out many economists <coughs> have actually found that younger workforces respond better and, and uh, change more rapidly and uh, the older workforces do better when the rules of the game remain unchanged. Market psychology, does demographic stasis trigger business pessimism? And this was written about a lot by Keynes and his followers like Alvin Hansen and so forth, and uh, uh, a big tradition uh, going through Kuznets and others. Market products is, is considered a, a, a stagnant, uh, a, production uh, resulting from stagnant or possibly declining workforce uh, size generally in the, in the literature generates a tendency toward excess capacity price wars and cartels stagnant labor markets higher labor adjustment costs because obviously you can no longer adjust labor by simply hiring fewer people you actually have to start firing people in an economy of stagnant size and in all markets any competitive public intervention these things is the the business historians look at. And finally, we look quickly at consequences in the uh, changing of social mood generally, not just in the economy. The psychology of aging and social outlook, and there's a fair literature on this. Um, there's an, you know, Cicero once used to say, youth are for action and older for counsel. You know, the old idea that people have different temperaments as they grow older. And this is what we might call the age effect. And there's a very large literature on this. In fact, we tend to become a little bit more rigid in our outlook and inflexible. We tend to see things the way we saw things coming of age, right? We, it's harder for us to, uh, to, to see things in a new way, which is the way young people see things. And also, there's not just, that's biological, there's also the rational difference. When you're older, you have less time left. So of course you're gonna take fewer risks. Let's face it. Uh, I'm not going to be around as long. Uh, it's, it's, the life isn't going to be quite the same to me. And we actually calculated in the developed countries the uh, share of the population that will, that will have less than 20 years of life remaining. Uh, very interesting. Uh, it, uh, it's interesting to suppose how that might change the sort of the mood of a country. Shifting family structure. We're going to see fewer siblings and more firstborns. Nick Eberstadt projects, it suggests, that by the middle of the 21st century in Italy, 
Children in Italy, 60% of them will have no brothers, no sisters, no cousins, no aunts, no uncles. We will have very narrow and very long families with parents and great grandparents, but no siblings. And there's a literature on how this is going to change the personality of people growing up in such families, which I won't go into in this, at the moment, but it's quite interesting. Policy impact of weaker extended families. Extended families generally get people jobs, they are, they're social safety nets. Uh, will this encourage the state to come in and replace some of these functions? Growing ethnic and religious diversity. And if you have a, I think on this one, I'm just going to pass and say if you have a question about it, you can ask us. But there's some interesting new research on assimilation and social trust. Mm -hmm. Some of it, for instance, the, the recent findings from Robert Putnam, which is not so optimistic on this, on this, on the implications of diversity and, and social trust. And also the rise of what we might call diaspora politics, when we have a large share of the developed countries coming from abroad and actually having direct links from the politics and abroad. And finally, aging and electoral politics. And I, maybe I should say no more about that, but just think about the effect of organizations like uh, AARP when you have this enormous increase in the share of the, pot, the, share of the, of the adult population, that is to say basically the electorate, which is uh, over age 65. And with that, I told you I'd move rapidly through this subject. And I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Richard. Very good. Um, what, as the term global aging uh, implies, um, the aging of the pop population is indeed uh, a worldwide phenomenon. Um, most of the developing world is now in the midst of what demographers call the demographic transition. Uh, this is the shift from high fertility and high mortality that characterizes uh, uh, traditional societies to low fertility and low mortality that characterizes modern societies. Um, this occurred in the developed world uh, uh, beginning in the late 18th, uh, uh, early uh, 19th centuries, um, um, unfolded uh, over about two centuries, and the transition um, is now uh, complete. Um, in, in, in most of the developing world, um, it, it got underway in the 1950s as mortality rates, particularly uh, infant and child mortality rates, started to fall rapidly. Um, and, and then it accelerated uh, in the 1970s um, as fertility rates began to, uh, uh, began to decline as well. Now, since uh, the early 1970s, um, the fertility rate in the developing world overall has fallen from 5.1 uh, to 2.9. Um, um, the population growth rate uh, has declined from 2.2 percent per year to 1.3 percent per year, and the median age has risen, risen from 20 to uh, uh, 26. Um, but these overall numbers, how, how do I, I, this one here? Mm -hmm. Okay. The, uh, okay. There you go. Well, there we are. Okay. The, 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 these overall uh, uh, numbers, um, um, of course, conceal con uh, con considerable variation in diversity uh, across the developing world. Um, as Phil already mentioned, at, at the high end, you have uh, sub-Saharan Africa, um, um, where uh, fertility uh, is, is, is really still at traditional levels, an average of 5.6. Um, um, in China uh, and East Asia, uh, in Eastern Europe um, and in the uh, what we call the Russian sphere, um, basically Russia uh, uh, and the Ukraine and the the Slavic members um, of the uh, Commonwealth of of, of uh, independent states, uh, fertility is now beneath replacement. Um, Thirty-four percent of the population of the developing world now lives uh, in countries where fertility is beneath the 2.1 replacement level. Um, but at the same time, 46% uh, of the developing world's population lives in countries where fertility is still above three. Um, so in, 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 in fact, the countries of the world are becoming, they're, 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 they're not converging, they're becoming, um, at least over the next several decades, uh, less alike, um, not, not more alike. Now, despite uh, 
Well, this just shows the, uh, the, uh, the impact on the age structure measured by median age. Um, despite the uh, diversity, um, there are a number of demographers, political uh, scientists, and, and, and geostrategists uh, who suggest um, that unfolding demographic trends in the developing world are, are in fact pushing it um, toward greater peace, uh, uh, prosperity, stability, um, and, and ultimately democracy. Uh, we call this, uh, this is our, our coinage, I think, um, uh, the demographic peace thesis. And it starts from the observation that societies with very young age structures uh, tend to be prone to violence, um, instability, and state failure. And, and there's a large literature uh, that uh, uh, that, that demonstrates this. Um, according to Population in Action International, uh, between 1970 and uh, 1999, 80% um, of all civil conflicts in the world occurred in countries um, where uh, more than 60% of the population was under the age of, of 30. Uh, other scholars look at uh, what they call youth bulges, which is the um, uh, the population aged 15, in the volatile, volatile aged 15 to 24 age bracket uh, as a share of the total adult population. Um, and uh, uh, one, one, one prominent scholar, Heinrich Ertl, finds that each one percentage point increase in the youth bold share uh, increases the risk of conflict by 4%. Um, so the correlation between youth uh, and, and violence is well established uh, uh, in, in, in the literature. Um, uh, Population Action International uh, talks about the demographic transition as, as moving us towards a, a security demographic, a demographic um, that's more propitious uh, uh, towards, towards stability in the long run. Uh, French demographers Emmanuel Todd and Youssef Courbage um, talk about a, a, a rendezvous of, uh, uh, of, of nations as fertility decline um, brings about a convergence uh, uh, across uh, the developed and developing worlds in the decades ahead. Uh, geostrategist Thomas Barnett, um, looking at demographics in the Middle East, uh, says that time is on our side. Um, this is wait for the, the demographics to unfold. Um, and a lot of the problems uh, uh, that we have today because of uh, extremely young age structures will resolve themselves. Um, as you may have, uh, uh, as you may have guessed, we have a somewhat uh, different uh, perspective. Um, actually, looking at unfolding demographic trends in the developing world, we think that they're increasing uh, security risks, not decreasing them. Um, um, in, in the decades ahead, uh, that the period of greatest danger, in fact, lies ahead. Um, and, and as we'll come back to when we tie things together, uh, we see a confluence um, of, 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 of dangerous demographic trends, uh, uh, perhaps triggering um, major geopolitical uh, stresses and problems in the 2020s. Um, So let me, let me take our, uh, let me take, take you through our perspective on demographic, sort of the demographic challenge in the developing world uh, point, point by point. And, and the first point is that, you know, in fact, as we've seen, uh, the transition is progressing unevenly. Um, fertility hasn't fallen everywhere. Uh, in some places uh, where it's begun to fall, it's stalled. Uh, most obviously, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where the youth bold share of the adult of the pop the youth bold share of the adult population is now 35 percent, um, compared to about 16 percent in the developed world, that will barely change um, um, over the next 25 years, uh, uh, even under a projection which assumes that the transition progresses and fertility uh, uh, begins to decline. Um, now, in other regions of the developing world, youth bold shares are beginning to decline. Fertilities come down uh, in the Muslim world, uh, uh, both Arab uh, 
and non-Muslim Arab countries. It's come down dramatically uh, in, in, in Latin America. It's coming down in South Asia um, as well. Uh, but these regional averages uh, can be deceptive. Um, in fact, there are a significant uh, number of Muslim-majority countries, including um, Afghanistan, uh, uh, the Palestinian territories, Iraq, uh, Sudan, um, and, and, and Yemen, uh, where uh, the transition is, demographic transition has failed to gain traction. Um, fertility rates still tower in the four to seven range, and youth boulders will remain at sub-Saharan African levels uh, for at least uh, uh, the next two, two decades. Um, furthermore, uh, there's an additional dynamic um, which is largely missed by the demographics and security literature. And, and this is that the demographic transition is non-linear. When, <laughs> let me show you this next chart. You have declining youth bulges, um, so that's the 15 to 24 population over the 15 plus population uh, in the Arab world, non-Arab Muslim Asia, India and South Asia and Latin America. But here we're looking at the growth rate in the population 15 to 24. And what you have um, is an oscillating dynamic. Uh, you, you have a bust generation, a baby bust generation coming of age now um, in all four of these regions. So the rate of growth in the youth population is, is, is decelerating rapidly and youth bold shares are beginning to decline. So everybody says, well, you know, this is heading in the right direction. You know, time is on our side. but in the beginning in 2015, the bus generation will give way to an echo boom generation. It will be the children of the last, um, the, 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 the last generation born when, birth rate, when fertility rates were back up at six and seven will be coming of age. Okay. So you have, a lar you have a large generation. When fertility declines rapidly, it gives rise to a, a, a a series of echo booms and echo busts. Um, and you have an echo boom generation that will be coming of age uh, we'll, we'll, in the 2020s. And we'll come back to this uh, later a, in the presentation. There's a name for this, right? Oh, it's, it's called Sun's Law. The Sun's Law, yes. Yeah. A, a Swedish demographer actually talked about this in the, the turn of the century. And it became famous when you suddenly stop, a, a f suddenly plunge a fertility rate, you get this periodic isol <coughs> oscillation of, for, for many decades after that. And he, he was the first to observe this in the records. Right, right, exactly. In, in I think, in the mid-19th century, yeah. actually. Um, so you have stalled and backtracking transitions. Uh, the next big point, um, the next big point is that although there is a, a very strong correlation between youth and violence, it, it, and particularly civil, uh, uh, violence. Um, it turns out on closer examination uh, that it isn't the very youngest or the very poorest countries that are most prone to violence and least stable, um, but countries that are at least part way through the demographic transition and part way through the development process. And the development process generally tracks the timing and pace of the demographic transition. In, in, in most countries. There's, there's a substantial literature um, that's looked at uh, uh, age structure um, and uh, development uh, proxied in various ways by, by you know, per, per, per capita income um, and, and so forth going back uh, a, a century. Um, and it turns out that the highest incidence um, of violence and conflict is generally in the second or third income quintile. And among countries that um, are not, uh, don't have the very youngest age structures, but uh, uh, in which fertility has begun to fall, um, um, mortality rates have begun to fall, and populations have begun to, to, to age. And this correlation is strongest uh, for the, this sort of hump-shaped relationship between security threat and aid structure and development is strongest for the most serious types of security threats. Um, for interstate war, uh, for um, um, 
state organized murder, uh, genocide, um, and especially, uh, uh, especially relevant today for terrorism. Um, I, I don't know how many of you uh, noticed a couple of months ago, but uh, it, uh, a, a recruiting roster for Al Qaeda in Iraq was discovered. Um, that, that, that it's like a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an HR document. Um, it's sort of the, the, the intake recruiting roster um, that lists the, you know, the, the, the residents, the country of origin, the profession, the educational attainment, and, and, and so forth of all the foreign fighters coming in to join Al Qaeda in Iraq. A and where do they come from? Well, they don't come from poor Muslim countries. They come from middle income Muslim countries. Uh, 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 mainly in North Africa, uh, the Gulf, uh, countries, again, uh, that are at least part way uh, through the, 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 the demographic transition and the development process. And this should hardly be surprising um, because demographers and uh, particularly development economists who've looked at the development process all agree that it generates enormous economic, social, and cultural stresses. Um, I, I don't have time to, to, to dwell very much on these here. We discuss them all in the book, um, but let me, just, uh, uh, let, me just, let me just tick them off. First, there's integration. You take a traditional society and you integrate it into the global marketplace. Um, um, the, 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 econ the economy is mo monetized, traditional forms of, of of uh, family-based uh, 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 employment, uh, give way to, to wage employment, and so forth. Um, the society is exposed to the global culture. Uh, uh, I, I, I can't, who, who's the, who coined the term McWorld? Um, that was, uh, yeah, McWorld versus Jihad. Yeah, yeah McWorld yeah, versus, versus, versus Mc, Mc, Barber. Barber, Barber. Oh, right. Barber. Exactly, right. exactly. Exposed to the global culture. Um, as, as development progresses, uh, rates of urbanization uh, uh, accelerate, uh, generating mass internal migration uh, in many cases. Income inequality rises. Um, income inequality tends to be low uh, in traditional societies and low uh, uh, in affluent societies. Again, it's a hump-shaped, all of these stressors, or most of them are hump-shaped phenomena. In other words, the stress becomes rises during the course of development before, um, um, with rising affluence, it begins, to, it begins to fall off again. Inequality, um, international migration, uh, uh, ethnic strife, um, because during the course of development, some groups in society tend to do better in the marketplace than others. Um, um, there, 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 there are many, uh, Amy Chua uh, has a fantastic book on market dominant minorities um, and the stresses uh, that this causes uh, uh, with, with uh, 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 majority populations. Um, religious extremism um, and of course environmental degradation. Uh, so all of this rises uh, during the course of the transition and development um, before it, it, it subsides. Now this is not to say that perhaps at the end of the day the transition might not push towards greater peace and prosperity. But a, a point we really insist on in the book is that journeys can be more dangerous than destinations. Um, um, now, all of this can increase the risk of state failure. And, and this is a second big point, uh, uh, a second big takeaway, if you will. Um, but in reaction to that, uh, we argue that it also increases the risk uh, or the likelihood of neo-authoritarian reaction and consolidation. Um, I mean, the, the China model uh, has an enormous appeal in the developing world today. Uh, from Venezuela uh, and Vietnam to Libya and Burma and the United Arab Emirates. And, and it has a twofold appeal. And, 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 and the first appeal is, is obvious. This is the one everybody writes about. You know, it, 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 it's, it, it's the, the the, 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 the track record um, at sort of harnessing uh, uh, the forces of development and boosting economic growth. Okay? But, but there's a second appeal, um, and, and, and that's uh, it's, it, it's, um, 
uh, ability, perhaps, uh, to stave off uh, the so social chaos um, and risk of collapse that can occur in rapidly transitioning societies. So there's, there's both a heightened risk of state failure and a heightened risk of neo-authoritarian reaction um, in rapidly transitioning societies. And, 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 and some, sometimes, I mean, the very fact that sometimes both risks seem equally plausible uh, is, is itself uh, a very suggestive thing. Think of Russia, uh, which a decade ago uh, seemed on the verge of collapse and is now lurching uh, uh, back rapidly uh, towards an authoritarian state. Um, I seem to have gotten ahead of my presentation here, which is okay. Let me just... Uh, okay. Now, there's no, there's no question that if rapid development gives rise uh, uh, to rapidly rising living standards, that this can sort of catapult countries quickly over the worst, through the worst danger phase uh, of, of the transition and of uh, development. And in fact, there's a phenomenon which is much written about um, and, and, and which is, uh, in part, underlies the whole demographic uh, uh, peace thesis notion. Um, and this is the idea of the demographic dividend. Um, what happens when fertility first falls? Well, when fertility first falls, you have fewer kids to take care of. Society's dependency burden declines. Uh, you have a rising share of the population in the working years. Um, um, with a larger share of the population in the working years and declining dependency burdens, rates of savings uh, uh, and investment may rise as well. Women's time is freed up for participation in the market economy. Uh, uh, all of this can boost productivity and living standard growth um, in principle. Uh, but when you look around the world today, uh, it hasn't happened everywhere. In fact, it's only happened dramatically in East Asia. Um, this is the cumulative uh, uh, percentage increase in per capita GDP since 1975. 700% in East Asia, 158% um, in India and South Asia. Uh, if we looked at the past decade alone, India and South Asia is beginning, is, is, is beginning to, to accelerate. But looking at the past decade alone, the others wouldn't change all that much. And you, you, often, uh, uh, you, you often hear, well, you know, this has happened in East Asia because fertility declined first and the, de the, the transition has progressed more rapidly. Um, so this, this will happen in turn uh, in the other regions as they move through the transition. But in fact, dependency ratios have been falling and working age shares of the population have been rising um, and steeply uh, everywhere in the developing world uh, except sub-Saharan Africa since the mid-1970s. One study estimates that the difference in demographics between Latin America and East Asia accounts for only 11% of the difference in GDP, in per capita GDP growth. Um, so it requires more than demographics. It requires uh, 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 institutions and, and, and a culture and, and, and uh, uh, governments cap capable um, of, of harnessing uh, the, the favorable demographics um, um, and boosting growth. Phil, do I need to, do I have a few? Yeah, we want to. I, I know five minutes. Are you coming on next? Or what you well, you go ahead, Rich. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. see to you. Well, we're just, uh, just about done here. Um, let me move more quickly. Uh, uh, next point is that stalled transitions and backtracking transitions with this echo boom uh, pose um, um, a, a, a challenge to, to security, but, but so do transitions that proceed too fast and too far. Um, the, the, very, the very fact that fertility uh, has fall, fell so precipitously in East Asia, beginning in the, uh, 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 beginning in the 1970s, and has plunged beneath replacement um, this gave rise to this huge demographic dividend that helped boost economic growth, but this very fact means that East Asia now faces a massive age wave, which will be arriving when it has still at a much lower level of per capita income um, than uh, uh, the developed world was. 
at, at an equivalent stage in the transition. And I don't know how many of you know that uh, China uh, will actually be an older country uh, than the United States by the 2030s. Um, and this, this overlay of rapid aging and rapid development um, uh, act, can act as a multiplier on all the social stresses generated uh, by the transition and development. Um, um, we can talk more about that during the Q&A. Me meanwhile, uh, and Neil has already talked about this, and I think Phil as well, uh, population implosion uh, in Eastern Europe um, and, and the Russian sphere. 35% uh, uh, loss in the total population um, and, and even more than that in the working age population uh, by mid-century. Um, and finally, what we call the new demographic competition. Um, when fertility rates begin to fall, uh, they don't fall at the same rate necessarily uh, for all uh, ethnic and religious groups um, in a society. And, and in fact, um, throughout much of the developing world today, uh, we have widening uh, differentials in fertility and population growth rates. Um, this is true uh, in India between Hindus and Muslims, in Nigeria between Christians and Muslims, in the Balkans between, between Muslims and Serbs and Catholics. Um, and we see this in many parts of the world. Groups that are shrinking um, um, rel relatively as a share uh, of the population may feel their traditional position and privileges threatened. Groups that are growing uh, more rapidly may feel emboldened to seize more power. Um, all of this, this dynamic um, can be further uh, exacerbated by rapid development um, because as I mentioned some groups do better in the marketplace than others um, and also uh, by very rapid, uh, by rapid democratization because the ballot box um, empowers uh, the, the majority. Um, there's a second type of demographic competition, which uh, Phil, uh, uh, Phil Longman has written about, um, uh, competition within uh, uh, ethnic and religious groups between the more secular and the more religious. Um, there are very large differentials in fertility rates um, according to intensity of religious conviction. This is true in the United States. Uh, there's a, a statistic that, that Phil cites. Uh, the fertility rate in red zone Utah is 50% higher than the fertility rate in blue zone Vermont. Um, it's, true in, uh, uh, it's true in Israel where the fertility rate for ultra-Orthodox ultra -orthodox Jews is, is I, I, I think, 6 or 6.5 uh, versus 2.5 for uh, more secular Jews. It's true in the Muslim world uh, where, where those who um, uh, when asked the question, should Sharia only be the law of the land, um, um, those who say yes, uh, 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 those who say yes, this is among um, urban, uh, urban dwellers uh, have a fertility rate that is twice as high as those who say no. Um, and, and this suggests that the, the, deg the degree towards which the transition and falling fertility is pushing countries towards modernity, you had a great quote on this, Phil. Um, um, which I'm trying to recall. Uh, maybe uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll look in my. I'll look in my. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, modernity may be an evolutionary disadvantage. I, I, I think, or something to that effect. Maladaptation. Right. And then finally, um, at the family level, uh, another kind of demographic transition. This time between baby boys and baby girls. Uh, in many rapidly transitioning societies in East and South Asia. Um, we now see these huge gender imbalances. Um, um, in, in China, uh, uh, in, 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 in China, the gender imbalance is now 117 or 18 boy babies born for every 100 girl babies. In a normal population, that's 104 or 105 for every 100. Um, you know, in a, in a context of falling fertility, of sub-replacement fertility, these traditional societies want to ensure that they have at least one son. Uh, the, this gender imbalance will give rise to bachelor surpluses, um, which may pose big uh, uh, security problems uh, uh, for China 
uh, in, 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 in the future. It will also ultimately uh, give rise to um, um, well, bachelor surpluses and bride shortages and ultimately uh, to daughter-in-law shortages, um, which will greatly complicate uh, the, the challenge of caring for the elderly in a society in which only one out of six people is accumulating any right to public or private pension coverage. Um, people depend on the extended family. Um, in a Confucian culture, it's the son uh, uh, that has that responsibility but it's for, for caring for his parents in old age, but it's not the son that does the caring, it's the daughter-in-law. Um, so we, we just, our, our purpose really is, is, is to raise a series of, 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 of cautions um, a, a, about what we, uh, about what, what we think is a, um, um, in, in, an inappropriate uh, complacency about these emerging demographic threats. And let me just turn this back to you to wrap up. For, for yeah, do you want, well. We're, we're, we'll turn it over to, okay. Yeah, I'll turn sure. it over to questions. Now. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to ask one quick question. Don't take too long answering it, because um, I, I do want to give some time for the folks. But um, a big part of your analysis um, uh, points to the great differential in the U.S. demographic position versus the rest of the developing world. And I, I'm just curious how confident you are um, that the United States is going to remain immune um, to these factors that have been driving down fertility um, among our peer competitors. Um, we're seeing, you know, very rapid declines in fertility in the Latin world. Um, uh, we know that there's some kind of iron law that says that although aging societies on paper need immigration uh, very much, um, a feature of their aging tends to be um, increased xenophobia for the kind of differential fertility reasons you're talking about. Um, uh, in general, historically, there's about, I think, four major reasons why people have had children. The biggest one is they've had them by accident. Um, as Americans, we've figured that one out pretty much. Um, they, they had children um, because children in a rural economy uh, make contributions to the household at particularly young ages, five or six, they can um, feed the chickens and such. Um, that's not a factor for us. Um, uh, people had children because uh, it was uh, the only sort of viable way of, of uh, gaining support in old age. Um, and now we have an advanced financial system and, and the welfare state that uh, gives us at least a chance of being able to enjoy retirement without actually being parents, um, just as long as everybody else becomes a parent. And, and, you know, and then there was also um, the reason uh, to have children that God said to have children. Um, which I think does explain, you know, the much higher differential rate um, among Orthodox and, and more secular folks. Um, and I do think it's a large reason why the United States does have a higher uh, birth rate than, um, say, Canada or Europe, where secularism is much more pervasive. But nonetheless, um, that's just one of the four <laughs> reasons um, that we might be clinging to. What, what, are, what are your theories as to why uh, we've escaped this downdraft that uh, well, the rest of the world has, and, we, and uh, we we haven't escaped it. I mean, obviously, the fertility rate today is much lower than it has been historically. If you look at fertility rate in the United States of the past two centuries, it looks like a long drop from about eight in the early 19th century down mm -hmm. to what it is today. However, uh, we do have a different culture in this country. We do have a different attitudes. Uh, we do have a different level of secularism, as you, you were just uh, alluding to. Uh, we are a nation of, of, of immigrants, and we have that, that tradition and that infusion which works strongly in our culture. And I, I would say the biggest reason is, is the extraordinary stability uh, since the late 1970s in the fertility rate. It was really stabilized at about 2.0 to 2.1, and it's been what? 25 years now. It really hasn't changed. In fact, lately, we've had two peaks right around 1990 in the last few years when it's gone back up just about to 2.1. So I'm just, the biggest reason is, is that we've now had almost a full generation of real plateauing and no real tendency to change. So we figure, heck, <laughs> let's just leave it and, right and there. And in many of the low fertility countries in, in, in Europe, uh, in Japan, we've had a full generation 
uh, uh, fertility um, uh, well beneath replacement. Which sets a new social there doesn't norm. seem there doesn't right. seem to be a lot of movement. Yeah. Con right. Countries seem to have stable. The United States seems to have stabilized at a higher level. Great. Well, let's open it up. Yes, sir. Director Bassi, consultant, national security policy. Uh, there are two points I would like to make. One of them is extension of longevity. I have been following biogerontology very closely for the last six, seven years, attending conferences and such. It has been growing, and uh, what key biogerontologists are telling me that if they get enough money, they can extend longevity, and this is critical, without aging-related diseases, without cancer, you know, heart diseases, uh, whatever, for anywhere between 10 to 20 years, within 20 years. Now, I proposed a Manhattan Project for human longevity, because uh, the cost of, uh, of uh, uh, medical care is killing us, and this will give us a retreat at least for, for 20 years or so. I don't know how this is going to affect your uh, scheme of things. Probably not very seriously, but it would create new problems and new challenges. For example, if we get a human population which uh, whose longevity is extended by 20 years, and these are vigorous healthy people, the most competent of them will stay on their jobs. The least competent will obviously retire and, and uh, obtain their social security. But this will block promotion for the younger generation. So they can wait uh, two, three, five, ten years, but then they will become restless. This will pr uh, create instability. And then we have to correlate this with uh, <coughs> aging and such. And, how much instability will be created and what this means for society, that, that remains to be seen. Second point I would like to bring, which you, you didn't bring up here, is the cost of uh, aging on, uh, for Medicare and, uh, and healthcare in general. I computed that uh, on the basis of statistics that uh, the Social Security provides us and such that by the year uh, 2080, the annual cost of Medicare will be $14.75 trillion. This is killing the country. I mean, this is killing the military budget. This is killing other uh, budgets and, uh, and, 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 uh, and so on and so forth. So that we would be a very serious problem. Question? I'm uh, finishing. <laughs> I'm completing this. So that's why I proposed this Manhattan pro Project for Human Longevity. We've got, we got to do something about it. Um, you know, there reminds, there's the old joke of the uh, Surgeon General that comes to the President and says, I have good news and bad news. I think Phil may remember this. And uh, the President says, well, you know, start with the good news. And he says, well, we've just had this incredible medical breakthrough. Everyone will be able to live to 170. The president says, that's wonderful. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I have to announce this to the American people. What's the bad news? And he says, well, to pay for it, everyone's going to have to work to 150. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to have to spend all our money on doctors. Right, <laughs> right. But, but the point, it, it, it's interesting. We, uh, our longevity assumptions are generally fairly <coughs> conservative. And I, and I know uh, Richard can explain that in detail. But they assume... Uh, less than historical rates of longevity growth. So obviously, probably mo more of the surprises in these projections would show up on uh, uh, on higher higher than projected uh, longevity, meaning older populations. Obviously, we would have to restructure uh, uh, senior entitlement systems throughout the developed world in order to afford. We're going to have to restructure them anyway in order to afford the longevity we were already projecting. One interesting question, though, that, that, that would, came up in our research in this book, which we had not previously investigated, was the, um, what does this mean for the workforce? Let's assume that we can have people work longer. And what was fascinating, and I didn't know before reviewing this literature, and, and you can take a look in our book, we sort of summarize it there, is that over the last century, 
the age at which great inventions are made, great discoveries are made, uh, most measures of, of, of creativity at the highest level have shown no tendency to age. Uh, and in other words, what we may end up with are experienced, great people, you know, doing wonderful things, but not really adding to that period of life which is most associated with sort of creative breakthrough. Uh, fascinating uh, studies of Nobel Prize discoveries, of great books, great paintings, uh, contributions to the academic literature, uh, uh, and, and quite, quite a variety of studies. And we, we summarize them in the book. And I think that's actually worth thinking about. Uh, people may be living longer, but they may be contributing, but they may be contributing increasingly in that category of what I describe as the uh, crystallized knowledge rather than the fluid knowledge, rather than the new discoveries. And that could change the tone of our society in a very interesting and somewhat unprecedented way. There's a question up there. You still have your question? Oh, um, yes, I guess. As you said, you went through the, the information rather rapidly. Um, I was just wondering, do you have any um, predictions or suppositions about how the changes you've described would affect political stability in, in the United States, or not? Um, what would you, uh, we, we, do, we do talk, I mean, some of our, some of what we describe, I think, touches on those issues. For instance, right. when we talk about diaspora politics, we, I, I did go quickly over these things. We yeah. certainly talked about the changes in, uh, in uh, the, the aging of the electorate in terms of its influence yeah. on public budgets. We have a, a discussion of the changing shape of the family, how it's going to influence on what people expect from government. Uh, we talk, too, about uh, the temperamental differences of the children of very small families, how that might change their behavior as voters uh, and as business leaders. So there is, a, I would suggest that's all in chapter, so, chapter three. Chapter three. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just, just, to, you know, just to follow up on what Neil said, it, you know, in, in a aging, uh, uh, an aging electorate and an aging population, but will probably tend to lock in current priorities, make it more difficult to to shift resources uh, uh, to new priorities. Um, it may it may make it more difficult for uh, society to respond to foreign policy emergencies. Um, we, we think all of this is likely to be more acute uh, in the more rapidly aging societies of uh, 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 Europe. Um, and in Japan, it will be in the United States, but these are issues here, too. One issue we talk about as well is the image of the developed world in the eyes of the <laughs> developing world, which may seem increasingly, in terms of soft power, in terms of our cultural image, may seem increasingly to the developing world as, a, as, a, as an image of elders. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the culture of the 60s, which went around the world and everyone thought about these young kids in jeans, and, you know, uh, uh, that image will instead seem like a uh, an old culture to, to, to younger people. And when Richard mentioned the, the idea of the rise of neo-authoritarian regimes, I, I would suggest that they may try to co-opt the image of uh, being really in favor of the young versus all of these, these liberal democracies which are increasingly the, uh, the, the bastion of, of old people out of touch with the aspirations of the world's rising generations. I can see, I can, I can, I, it's not hard for me to, to see that 20, 30 years down the road. <laughs> Particularly if we don't engage more constructively in, in the developing world. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I wonder if you could sort of put together your optimism about the United States economy and security issues. For example, if we're going to be really, continue to be relatively rich, would we do what the Romans do? In other words, hire legions, hire divisions from the developing country to, to use um, as our proxy armies? Well, I, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to see um, um, various, uh, we're going to see more and more substitution, first of all, of technology for labor. Uh, but we argue in the book uh, for, for military manpower, but we argue that, that there is a limit to that, um, and that you will always need uh, a, a boots on the ground. And so we're also going to see, as you suggest, uh, uh, various ways to uh, substitute um, non-native uh, for, for native manpower. Now, now this is 
you know, th this is an area where the United States, like, uh, uh, like ancient Rome perhaps, um, um, enjoys uh, a certain advantage. Uh, because we, we don't necessarily have to hire mercenaries. Um, the offer of citizenship uh, is an enormous inducement to service. Uh, we have very, very high, high rates of uh, uh, enlistment among uh, Hispanic uh, immigrants. The government uh, has already uh, um, expedited uh, the uh, naturalization uh, uh, process for, uh, for legal per permanent residents who, uh, who enlist in the armed forces. And, and, and some uh, security experts, uh, uh, you know, Max Boot uh, over at Brookings, um, ha has argued that we should actually begin actively we not only recruit illegal immigrants here, but actually begin recruiting potential immigrants uh, uh, abroad. But, but all of that comes with a caveat, uh, and that's that you know, Rome also learned uh, that, that you know, the, the point at which you know, citizens no longer feel it's their duty to defend their country uh, is, is the point at which a civilization begins to uh, decline. But we are certainly going to see a lot more of that. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> first, I want to say just the, the flagging of these possibilities, um, uh, daunting though they are, uh, is an important ser service and gift to those of us who would like to create a more hopeful set of <coughs> possibilities. Uh, but two kinds of possibilities occur to me in the context that you're talking about. One is, I see some optimism in the hope that the species may respond to global warming like we have something collectively in common, and that that has the possibility of different kinds of dynamics and dialogue that put our common faith and some sharing in place, at least, and, and make uh, you know, I, I, I see already the industrial economy paying for green space, paying for trees elsewhere and protecting the rainforest. And, and so I, I see those kinds of, of possibilities as a, as a kind of collective sanity. The, the other thing that I see is, as people talk about the concerns that you have about uh, Medicare and care, for, and care and disability, my own work has been to create a different medium of exchange that would enable people by earning, uh, by, by civic engagement, to earn different forms of informal support and to rebuild connectivity and community as a different exchange process to begin. And that, that the work that the market requires may be less, the work that we need to build community to deal with child development as as an authentic new frontier and uh, elder contribution as a different kind of civic contribution, uh, that, that the, the, the kinds of work that have been extracted from the community and marketized, uh, that, that looking at civic engagement, cultural development, uh, social justice efforts, those, those, those domains of, of labor that are not about market price may in fact be the labor, may in fact be the labor shift uh, to the 150-year employment that you're talking about. So I, I just throw those out as two kinds of, of heightened. We need to think about other possibilities just because of what you're sharing with us. So, since we're getting short on time, why don't we take uh, two more questions and you can answer the, the last three all at once, okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, yes, sir. Yeah. I want to I want, uh, uh, kind of say a little more about China. Uh, you have mentioned the the premature aging in China. I want yes. to you a little bit more. And uh, what's the implication uh, for China? You know, in China, uh, there's a huge population, and uh, there's a policy of uh, 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 one baby, one child. One child. Yeah. So and there's a still that some how to say some people argue they should change this policy. So what was your uh, comment on this? Can you ask question? Uh, yeah. You talk about the increased rigidity of the aging population, psychological rigidity and economic conservatism probably goes along with that. Does your uh, demographics 
imply that there would be a depressing market effect on productivity and uh, entrepreneurial spirit as the population ages? Okay, that's it. Right. You get, yeah. one, get one more. You mentioned fertility as though it's dropping and falling, but I would like to say that women, only women bear children. And their fertility has not changed the ability to bear a child. It's just their choice to have children. So if you, fertility is a question of asking women what is it that would make them want to have more babies or less babies. And perhaps that's a focus that we should be looking at. Okay, that's, that's important. Good. Well, that's a good question. They're all, they're all, they're all good questions. Should, should we take them in uh, what order should we take? Uh, well, let me. I've got them listed here. Let me take first the one on the, uh, the aging and productivity and the, the, the question you asked. Um, it, it's interesting. When you look at the literature and they suggest that, the, these, that these two, you know, one thing rises with age and that's experience. And certain capabilities, interestingly, such as uh, uh, usage of words and various kinds of verbal categories actually don't really decline much with age. Other things, all of the basic things of uh, you know fast reaction time, solving solving new kinds of puzzles and so on, actually decline fairly rapidly. It's kind of scary for me to think after, after the mid twenties. I mean, you see the literature, it's, and it's it's all levels of ability. Very smart people, uh, 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 not so smart people, uh, both genders. Uh, it's been done across cultures. This stuff is is extremely robust. This research. Okay, you got some things going down. You got some things going up. It turns out that one of the uh, central findings of this literature is that people in their 40s are often a very good sort of uh, compromise here. Some economists actually think that productivity rises with uh, productivity growth rates rise most with economies with a large share of their workforce in the 40s. When you when before the 40s, you get the problem of not enough experience. After the 40s, you get too much rigidity. The the problem that's also been identified is that an aging workforce is not so bad when the economic conditions or the technology does not change much. And according to a couple of researchers, uh, when the IT began to change very much, the whole information technology began to change very rapidly in the 1990s, the economies which were best at picking up on the productivity in those industries were the younger ones. In other words, the optimal age point of productivity actually went down the age scale. So I think that answers a little bit of I, I suppose if you're a very old uh, workforce and you want to remain um, in good shape, you probably should just hope things don't change. <laughs> you know, hope, hope the basic uh, context of competition and the basic nature of challenges probably don't change very much because you will be very effective at using what you learned to continue to excel in that area. I, I guess that would be one of the things I would infer from the literature, but you, know, you can judge for yourself looking at it. Um, you're absolutely right, uh, to, to come back to the fertility point, that only women have babies. Um, that, that's been my experience as well. <laughs> in, in, fact, in fact, I mean, demographers really are only interested in, 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 in women. Um, um, you know, in, in terms of tracking fertility behavior, they, they, they conduct surveys, they, they ask women, you know, what's the ideal number of children in a family? How many children do you expect to have? And then they look at how many they actually have, and they see how these compare over time. Um, um, one of the things that's, that's fascinating, uh, if you look across the developed world today, I mean, all, all countries are you know, at a, a fairly low fertility, a very low fertility level by historical, long-term historical standards. But, but you have this you know, considerable variation between uh, Japan, you know, down at 1.25 or 1.3, and, and and a lot of Medi and the rest of East Asia, actually, um, uh, and, and Mediterranean Europe also very low, and and uh, East, Eastern Eastern Europe and and the Russian sphere as well. But but if you look across the developed countries, um, what what are the big surprises if you're if you're not, you know, if you're not familiar uh, uh, with the data, um, it's kind of counterintuitive. You think, okay, a big driver of the fertility decline must be the entry of women into the labor force, um, um, and and you know the, the whole shift in in gender and social roles of women. Um, but if you look across the developed countries, the correlation runs 
precisely the opposite way. It's the countries that have the highest rates of female labor force participation that have the highest fertility rates. So, so what's going on? What's going on is that the countries that have been most successful um, at sort of adapting workplace and social institutions and family culture to the change role of women end up with higher fertility and higher labor force participation. And the countries that haven't, um, which tend to be the more traditional uh, uh, societies, end up with both low fertility and low female labor force participation. You know, and, and when I give a presentation on this in, you know, in Japan, I, I sometimes joke that the solution to the low fertility problem in Japan you know, is for men to start doing the dishes. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and and then, then there was the question on China. And you're absolutely right that there is a debate. You know, I was in China just two weeks ago. And, and there is a debate uh, uh, within, the, within the state council now. Um, it, 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 I, I forget who, but some officials suggested that they were going to re relax the one-child policy and do away with that, and that was it, vigorously denied. Um, but in fact, there, there is a, a, a debate, a, 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 a debate about, about that. It's an interesting qu question. I mean, how much would fertility go up in, in China if the one-child policy were, were scrapped all, all together? But it's, it's, it's not clear. Fertility's come down everywhere in East Asia. I mean, the lowest fertility countries in the world are South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and, and, and Singapore. But it, it came down much er at a much earlier uh, and, and lower level of, of per capita income in China, so it might, uh, it, it might come back up somewhat. But, but the, 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 whole, you know, the whole premature aging problem in China, I, I, I think, is, is, is a big deal because the age wave hits uh, 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 in full force um, this is the 2020s crisis. We, we, you know, we didn't manage to close the loop on that. But in the 2020s, just as China is, is so becoming a solidly middle, middle income country, all of a sudden the demographics that have been underpinning its economic growth uh, um, shift dramatically and start, and start pushing the, the, the other way. You, you can, I, I have a report called The Graying of the Middle Kingdom, um, and, and that's on our website. It's worth pointing out, too, that uh, actually a fairly large number of countries now are explicitly looking at, or have passed, uh, uh, measures intended to boost fertility. And this is all within the last five, six, seven years, including Germany and Spain, uh, Russia. This is becoming an hysteria. You know, this is Putin's number one national pri at the top of his agenda. And, and the fact that China is considering re relaxing its one-child law, I think, is, is part of this new movement. Uh, as, as Phil, I think, knows, in Portugal, they actually considered a measure that would you know, pick up on Shirley Berggraf's suggestion, uh, right? which was going to actually tie your Social Security benefits to the number of children you have. So there'd actually be a relationship which would bring back that relationship that you said no longer exists between having kids and how you're going to be uh, cared for in old age. Uh, no country has yet done that, but it would be very interesting to see if the next 10 or 20 years you don't see uh, developed countries actually proposing to link these two to reinstill that incentive. Yeah, there's, a, there's an extraordinary shift underway, in, 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 as Neil suggested, in, in attitudes you know, towards, towards family size and in pronatal policy. Um, we, 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 we quote a, 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 a slogan. Uh, uh, in, in the book, there, there was a family planning slogan in in, in, in Singapore, uh, which is uh, up up until a decade ago, which is two children is enough. Now the new family planning slogan is have three if you can. Uh, <laughs> and and in in South Korea, that there was you know in a government office, a family planning office, you know in the 1960s, 70s, and into the 80s, they went village to village, right, implementing family planning policies and passing out contraceptives and. and, and and so forth. That the purpose, the mission of that office has now been changed to raising birth rates. Um, there is a dramatic shift uh, 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 across all of these uh, low fertility countries, both developed and developing. Mm -hmm. um, on the radio today, I was hearing about food prices. So I wonder how the factor of just resource availability around food and oil, um, energy resources, 
uh, puts a twist on these on the analysis around market um, activity and so forth. Well, it, it certainly is going to add to the stress on these uh, low to middle income countries, developing countries that Richard was talking about. Uh, the, the, the linking of uh, biofuels projects and, and linking the price, therefore, of, of food to energy it strikes me as a very ominous development. <laughs> I'm not sure that we ever knew what we were getting into when we started going down that road, but it may have very <coughs> ominous implications for global security. Uh, and if the energy prices continue to go up, it will also result in enormous income transfers uh, from many of these middle-income developing countries to a relatively small number of energy producing countries, uh, not all of which are very stable or well disposed to the developed world in their own right. So all of this, both its implications for food prices as well as the income transfer means that this, this uh, if, if, we, if you know, if the peak oil theories is correct, and you know, if all these theories are correct, uh, this strikes me as very much a dangerous and destabilizing trend. Can I come back to that? Yeah. So, so that's on the side of the um, stability of international affairs, but on the side of demographics, would it actually also, would there be a kind of feedback loop um, and impact on demographic um, projections as well? Uh, you mean the, the actual, uh, the idea of high food prices and how many children people would have? I don't, that's an interesting, what do you? Well, um, if it were long term. Yeah. Well, cer cer certainly, it would, it would tend, it would tend to bring, it would tend to bring fertility, fertility yeah. down. Unless right, it reverse right, the right. flow from urban areas back to the countryside. Back to the countryside. We, 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 I should point, point out. That's <laughs> right. Reverse urbanization. Yeah. I should point out because unless you're, you know, except for the demographers in the audience, you might not be aware that these projections do build in the expectation of a substantial continued fertility decline in current high fertility areas of the developing world. I mean, we're not assuming that Africa remains at 5.7 indefinitely. The projections assume that it would come down. So I, I, I guess I'm not sure I've an answered, answered your question effectively, but I'm, like, I'm sort of I'm pointing out that it, it, it in, 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 in some, the fall in fertility is already built into the projection, so in that sense it wouldn't change the, 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 the numbers. When I'm thinking about it, uh, I'm thinking just over the last few decades, certainly falling fertility worldwide has, has, has been come about at the same time, has coincided with an unprecedented decline in the price, the real price of food. Um, so, I mean, at least there's that, right? I mean, think about it. There's that association. That's certainly true and throughout the developed world. Um, and uh, I remember a time when I was a kid when newspaper headlines talked about the price of milk. You know, that was a real middle class issue. I don't know anyone talks about it, you know, except very recently. It's coming back again. But, but uh, that has coincided with declining fertility. So I think it's uncertain. It's, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure what the answer is. I mean, it may, it may be that, that the, the fundamental dynamic driving falling fertility is rising affluence. Right? And, and you know, the, the, the ability to invest in quality of children rather than quantity. It's just sort of, d development triggers, well, they go hand, development goes hand in hand with, with, with lower fertility. And if you were to r r r rising agricultural prices, if you were to sort of slow this development process, you, you might actually push the other way. Right. It feels, feels right. So I, I retract my initial, my initial comment. <laughs> Well, I'm sure Richard and Neil will uh, be agreeable to staying around for a little bit afterwards yeah. and we can talk for them. But um, let's give them both a great applause. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.